Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Mini Sky tonight. So I wanted to present to you folks a couple of events that are coming up in the next few weeks, as well as to show you some of the constellations and planets and things that you can see this time of year. I know for some of you students that you're starting to get out of your classes, and now is a good time as any to step outside during the holidays to enjoy the nighttime sky with your family. So let's dive into what you can see in these next couple of weeks. So grab your calendars. So the first event I wanted to let you folks know about is on the evening of December 13th through the morning of December 14th is the Geminid meteor shower. So if you step outside during that evening and watch for a good while, you may see a few meteors streak across the sky. It's not as spectacular of a meteor shower as say the Perseids or the Leonids, but it's still a good meteor shower to behold. And you know, any wishing star is a good star, you know, especially considering it's 2020. So mark your calendars for that to step outside and at least catch a meteor now and then. The next night I wanted to show you folks is December 21st. So I have the program Stellarium set up. It's a phenomenal program and it's free to use on your laptops. So I will leave a link in the description below so that way you can download it for free and you can interact with it. You can learn a lot of different constellations, including different constellations that are how the stars are seen by different cultures and so much more. So on the evening of December 21st, if you look towards the southwest, you'll see this incredibly bright star. But in actuality, it's not a star at all. It's literally two planets that look really close together. They're not on top of each other, but they're really close in the sky. In astronomy, this is what is known as a planetary conjunction, where two planets look like they're really, really close together to where they almost look like one star. In fact, those planets are the planets Jupiter and Saturn. In fact, let's take a closer look just to show you that they're not exactly on top of each other. In fact, if you have a small telescope, I recommend looking in on this area because you can definitely see the two planets in the same field of view. So if you have a small telescope, this is kind of what you would see. Is basically you would see two planets really close together in the same field of view and it's a really cool sight to behold. So you see the bright planet Saturn and the bright planet Jupiter all close together in the same sky. But as you can see, they're not on top of one another. And the reason being is because their orbits are not exactly perfectly aligned and that's perfectly fine. And you, if you look closely and through a small telescope, you can definitely see the three Galilean moons and a few moons of Saturn as well. So that's a cool sight to behold on the evening of December 21st when you're spending time with your family and if you want to pull out a small telescope, check this planetary conjunction out. If you want to check out a couple of my other Sky Tonight videos where I do talk about Jupiter and Saturn, I'll leave a link in the description below as well so that way you can see some more details of those planets as well as, as I discuss some of the unique features of these two planets. Nonetheless, let's look at some of the constellations that you can see on the evening of December 21st. So let's progress time forward just a little bit to where it's in the evening. So around about seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, so after dinner time. So what constellations can we see in the evening sky on December 21st? Well, we can definitely see a few planets for like up here, you definitely see the bright moon, but as you could kind of slightly tell, there was the planet Neptune right close to the moon, but it's kind of difficult to see because Neptune is an incredibly faint planet. So with the moon glowing as bright as it is, you may not get to see it unless you know exactly where to look. But if we look over here towards the eastern sky, we'll see a familiar constellation that everybody recognizes. And he usually mounts the heavens close to Christmas time in around about midnight facing south. So since we're getting close to seven o'clock right here, he's starting to mount the heavens. It's the 
famous constellation Orion with his three stars in a row that form his belt, his upper body. He's holding out a shield right here and there's a club over his head and here's his lower body. There are two bright stars in the constellation Orion. This one right here is called Betelgeuse. I know many people pronounce it Betelgeuse, but it's Betel, Bet L Juice. This one right here is called Rigel. Notice these two stars' colors. Not only do stars come in different colors, but they also come in different sizes and shapes as, or different sizes as well. And a couple of different shapes, depending upon if they're distorted by gravity and everything. But mostly different sizes and different colors, because color is an indicator of temperature. The more red in color you are, the cooler in temperature you are compared to the sun. The more blue in color you are, the hotter in temperature you are compared to the sun. So Betelgeuse is kind of a deep orange color, so it's cooler compared to the sun. But Rigel is bluer in color, so therefore it's an incredibly hot star compared to the sun. And they're really big too. But hidden right underneath Orion's belt, right here is this little fuzzy patch right here. It goes by several different names, but what it's mostly known for is the Great Orion Nebula. So let's take a look into it. I've pointed towards one of the stars that is in Orion Nebula. So here you are, this beautiful, gorgeous nebula. The Orion Nebula is what is known as a stellar nursery, because in here, is where stars are being born and formed. So how are stars formed? Well, inside the nebula, you have gas, dust, ice, all sorts of materials coalesced into this gassy area. It's kind of a vacuum of some kind where things can be pushed and pulled with ease. It's not really solid. So what happens is that sometimes those dust particles and those ice particles start to stick together and become more massive. And then more parts stick together and it becomes more massive. Well, the more mass you accumulate, the greater of a gravi gravitational influence you have. So as start st stuff starts to accumulate, it starts to create a mass, which then pulls in more stuff because of its gravity. Eventually it starts collecting all this gas and then the gas starts to heat up. It becomes, a, it becomes like a pressure cooker where basically gravity is pulling all the stuff in and condensing it and the heat from the gas because it's being pushed is trying to push out. Eventually things become stable where gravity and heat reach an equilibrium and then that's when fusion starts to take place inside a star. And then it puffs out its outer layers. So the, all you have left is basically a beautiful brand new baby star and planets that form around it. In fact, inside the nebula right here, these little tiny stars, one of them which I pointed to, is a baby star. It's one of the newly formed stars from the Orion Nebula. So you may ask, what's inside a nebula that it creates stars? Well, what if I told you that the majority of the elements that are on the periodic table of elements exist inside a nebula? Because a lot, not only do you get stars that form inside nebulas, but you also get planets as well, because star and planet formation go hand in hand. So when a plant, a star is formed, star, little planetesimals start to form around it and they start to build up to become full-blown planets. And the same materials that were used to create the star also was used to create the planet. So think of it this way, the stuff that was used to once create our sun the nebula that once created our sun was also the same type of nebula that created our planet Earth. So we are but such stuff that stars are made out of. And I always think that's really cool. And the great thing about the Orion Nebula is if you have a pair of binoculars or small telescope, you can definitely see this fuzzy patch in the sky with ease. So from Orion, let's use Orion's belt to find another constellation. So if you take your Orion's belt 
and go up and to the right, you'll kind of see this triangle shaped object or this V-shaped group of stars. That V-shaped group of stars is called the Hyades, which forms the face of Taurus, the bull. The bright star in Taurus, which lies right here, is called Aldebaran. I like to think of it as the bull's eye. But hidden right back behind Taurus is this unique little cluster of stars that you can see plain with your, plainly with your unaided eye. Now, many people confuse this little cluster for the Little Dipper, but in actuality, it's not. The Little Dipper is much, 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 much bigger. This is what is known as the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, the Seven Indian Maidens, the Seven Little Eyes of Monarihi, or Subaru. That's right. Subaru is Japanese for the Pleiades. In fact, when you look on the emblem of a Subaru vehicle, you'll see these stars. In fact, if you can zoom in just a little bit right here, yeah, you kind of can see the emblem of the Subaru vehicle right there. But this is what is known as an open cluster. So let's kind of center in here and look at what it kind of looks like up close and personal. So when you look at it with a pair of binoculars or small telescope, it looks like a big open area with stars in it. But if you have the unblinking eye of a camera, you get to see this light blue kind of haze around some of the stars. That's the remaining nebula that created these stars. So these are the last of the baby stars. It's known as an open cluster because you can definitely see the distance between the stars easily where its cousin, a globular cluster, the stars look so compact together, you can't tell the distance between the stars. It kind of looks like a big, huge blob or, or a glob, hence why a globular cluster. All right, what else can we see? So up over here to the left of the moon, you'll kind of see this red star. This fortunately is a planet that you can see. That is the bright planet Mars. So let's center in and zoom in on it. So you can definitely see two planets on top of each other and the lonely red planet Mars. And of course, if you have a really good strong telescope, you get to see these two little faint stars right there. Those two faint stars are the two moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. But they're really, really hard to see. And of course, this is some of the surface details of Mars. If you want to check out some of my other videos, I do a lot of descriptions of what some of the features on Mars are. Oh, let's zoom out. Okay, so let's progress into the evening because I wanted to show you folks another constellation that I always think is really cool. So around about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, you'll, if you take Orion's belt and go down into the left, you'll run into this incredibly bright steer. This bright star right here is called Sirius. In fact, for you Harry Potter fans, J.K. Rowling took her inspiration from the stars. The, the character Sirius Black gets his name from this star. In fact, all of the Black family get their names from stars. He has a brother named Regulus. Regulus is a star in the sky in the constellation Leo. He has a sister, Bellatrix. Bellatrix is a star in the constellation Orion. In fact, there's Bellatrix. But this is the bright star Sirius. The bright star Sirius is the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog. So even JK Rowling took her inspiration from the stars a little further because Sirius Black turns into a big dog. Sirius the star is in the constellation Canis Major, the big dog. In fact, I like to think of it as its dog collar or tag on its body. 
So the bright stars right here. So you kind of can see a dog out of this. I always like this constellation because it actually does look like a dog. So you see here his head, here's his body, his two legs and two legs back here and he's got a tail. It looks like a dog. Whereas in many of the other constellations, you're like, okay, maybe if you squint just right, or if you use your imagination, it kind of does. No, but this actually kind of looks like a stick figure dog. So you get to see the brightest star, not only in the constellation Canis Major, but Sirius is the brightest star in the entire nighttime sky. Of all the stars in the sky that you can see, Sirius is the brightest. Now, many people often confuse like the North Star is the brightest star in the sky, but it actually isn't. It's the 52nd brightest star. So good luck hunting for the North Star if you're doing it by brightness. Oh, the fun thing about the Solarium uh, program too is sometimes it puts in little uh, shooting stars for you just for kicks and grins. That's what I always enjoy about it. So if you sometimes stare at even the Stellarium program, if you just want to see a shooting star, you can see a shooting, shooting star in Stellarium. I think it's really cool. Nonetheless, not, I mentioned there was a Canis Major, but believe it or not, there's also a Canis Minor, the little dog. If you take Orion's two shoulder stars and go to the left, you'll see these two stars. Yeah. Canis Minor is literally two stars. I'm sorry, but two stars do not a constellation make. That, that, that's just, I call it lazy. But whatever. But nonetheless, the brightest star in the constellation Canis Major is called Procyon. In fact, sometimes I like to joke around and said, okay, so Orion had two famous hunting dogs. He basically had a Great Dane and he had a Dachshund. Because, you know, a Great Dane and a Dachshund. All right, one more constellation. If you take Rigel and you take Betelgeuse, and if you follow them up in a straight line, you'll see these two stick figures in the sky. The two stars at the head of the stick figures are the names of the two people in this constellation. This is the constellation Gemini, the twins. And their names are basically the names of the heads of the stars. This one is called Pollux. And this one is called Castor. Those were the names of the twins. If you look into the story, Jason and the Argonauts, these are the two twins. So those are some of the planets, nighttime objects and constellations that you can see around about December. So while you're stepping outside and looking at some of the holiday lights, also check out some of the constellations as well. In fact, I left a video that talks about some of the different holiday light displays that you can see throughout the year. I can leave a link in the description below for that. If you have any questions or comments or a topic you would like for me to cover over, leave it down in the comments. If there's anything that you would think that would be cool for the new year, let me know and I would be happy to cover over it as well. Also, parents, if you're looking for a fun activity for your kids to do, futurereadysa.org is a fun interactive site that basically encourages your kids to do these fun activities and earn digital badges. I'll leave a link in the description below so you can check it out. Also, since we're getting close to the holiday seasons, if you're looking for a fun gift idea, I recommend Earth to Sky Calculus. It's an organization that promotes kids that do research so they can get scholarships to go on to college. And what they do is they send up high altitude weather balloons with specific equipment on it to do research. And they also send up a payload of random objects to officially be in space. And then they sell those objects to help build the scholarships as well as to help provide money to do future research projects and send up other balloons as well. So not only are you buying a unique object that has officially been in space, but you're buying an opportunity for students. So a win-win. In fact, this necklace that I'm wearing right now has officially been in space. So I always think that's cool. So I can officially say I have something that has been in space. And so if you're looking for a fun gift for a space enthusiast, I would recommend these. So until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, never stop learning.